Welcome to this repair overview for an Arcam Alpha 7R. The Arcam brand is very, very well known as a uh, British audio brand and goes back many, many decades. And about circa 1998, this model was released, and Arcam also had a number of other units within the range. Those included the Arcam Alpha 1, the 8R, and the 8P, and the 8P being a power amplifier really utilising the same output circuit as the 8R. For some of you listening, you'll also also remember the Arkham Alpha 9 and Arkham Alpha 10, but for this repair description, we're really only covering what would be applicable to the 1, 7R, 8R and 8P. During that time, Arkham also released a number of complementary products. So you would find a CD player, for example, also a tuner, and... Arkham received a number of industry awards, so what Hi-Fi award around sort of 1999. When you look at this amplifier design, it is to some degree complex when you look from a circuit point of view, but the good thing is, is that the service manual, which is free to download, provides quite an in-depth repair description in terms of the circuit, the, the actual operation of the input processing protection circuits, and also how you would then adjust it uh, after repair and for myself I've also put together a repair guide and again if anyone is interested you can by all means email uh, to audio amplifier servicing at aol.com I'm quite happy to share that with you now this amplifier came into the workshop and during the initial test it became evident that the speaker protection relay was not changing over but the power LED which would normally be green under normal operation was amber and what that signifies to you is that the protection circuit has operated. Now, often when I go through the repair descriptions, what I provide is an insight into problems which can occur, which are related either to the amplifier design or maybe the construction of the amplifier and which manifest in different types of faults over time. So the fault description here is exactly that. And what I'm going to refer to here is during manufacture, what happens is that the components, of course, are installed and then soldered. And then the excess leads of these components are cut off. And what happens here, and this affects most of the Arkham Alpha range, okay? So you may also see this, for example, on the 9 or the 10 series, or even the FMJ or the Full Metal Jacket series, which came later. And the issue is, is that on the output MOSFETs, on the left and right channel, you have the three pins coming in from the MOSFET, and then during manufacture, literally the leads have been cut off, but not cut off flush to where the solder joint finishes. It goes below that. So instead of you having this bright concave where the solder is adhered to the legs, it's been cut off. And then over time, you get dry joints that then appear around the solder pins. And you can see this in the video. And that's exactly what has happened here. So in terms of disassembly, what you have to do is go to the rear of the amplifier and you don't have to remove the complete back plate. You can leave that in position so you don't have to remove all of the different screws where you have the speaker terminals and the RCA Fano sockets. Just remove the ones which attach it to the main chassis. And then from the top, you'll need to remove the large bolt which secures the toroidal transformer to the base plate. And then what you'll see is that there's four individual grounding screws, three at the front, and then one towards the rear of the amplifier where you see the speaker protection relay. And then remove or just pull off the front control knobs. And then what you can then do is just release left and right. There's four fixing screws. And there's two little clips underneath which would then allow you then to remove the uh, front bezel or front fascia. And then you can see the amplifier. And then to remove it fully from the chassis, you'll have two screws left and right. And then once you remove those, you can then lift up the whole amplifier um, main board complete. And the good thing about that is you've not disconnected the output MOSFETs, for example, from the heat sink. And that makes repairing the amplifier a lot easier. And you can see in the repair video that it's vertically mounted, and I'm showing you that. Um, and then you also have, I suppose, in a way, a little bit of advertising for deoxid because uh, you can see the switch cleaner, which is uh, commonly used, but I'll, I'll refer back to that in a little while. So the first thing, or the work that was is undertaken here is, and I often refer to something like a systematic approach. Now I know, because if you went onto the landing chart or landing page of the audio amplifier servicing site, if you just use the search bar and you type 
Arkham Alpha, you'll come up like literally hundreds of repair descriptions where you have the music playing in the background and then you'll see the fault description. And what I'm doing here is very, very common. And the fault finding approach is exactly the same. So yes, we resolder the MOSFETs, but there's a number of other things that you need to do to add longevity to the repair. And this is because it's it's over time that these faults appear. So what I'm doing is I literally I'll rotate the board around and then I'm looking from the rear where the RCA sockets are and then I'm just starting from left to right and work my way around the board. So what I'm looking at, and again the repair video shows this, you can see dry solder joints which are cracks around the RCA input sockets. And this is normal. Wherever you have mechanical stress, this will always occur. So I'm literally I'm block soldering all of the RCA input connectors and then what I then do is I literally desolder or remove the solder around the MOSFET pins because they've been cut too low and then I then reflow them so you get this nice concave very very bright solder joint which means you know that's a really really good secure connection and then what I also look at is the speaker terminals and I look at this in two ways you can sometimes get dry solder joints around the speaker terminals but the video also shows the backdrop of the speaker terminal posts and these can be replaced so if you just have maybe one which is damaged or snapped off for a repair you can actually use a flat blade screwdriver to undo the locking uh, captive nut and then remove it but what you will find is that over time some of these become loose so when I was looking at this amplifier three of them was, were solid didn't didn't turn when I put the flat blade screwdriver in but the remaining ones and one of them particularly went almost you know a quarter of a turn so I show that in the video, but again, I'm telling you insight here, this is something you just need to check. Once that's then done, I'll then move to the power input socket. And again, because it's mechanical and the stress on the solder joints, I reflow them. The next point then is the headphone socket. And again, it's shown and often you will find broken solder connection joints around the headphone socket. And remember that, so that socket also has switching contacts so when you insert the jack plug what it does is it opens a set of contacts which means that the speaker output protection relay will disengage so effectively muting the speakers and then the other contacts of course is then connecting to the jack plug for the stereo and then also the uh, the common ground then so again resolder there the other points of stress are the user controls so you can see the switches and also the potentiometers. So this is your balance control, this is your volume, volume control, treble and bass, and then where you can then select tape, tone defeat or direct mode, and then also the speaker set one or two selection. So this speaker set two. So what I'm doing then is I just flow, reflow the solder of all of these. And it's very common, right? If you don't undertake this work, you get to the point where you're in the testing phase and then you get an issue then where you have maybe intermittent loss of sound and it's, it's literally down to a bad connection. The next thing that I focus on then is the input selection switch and you'll see this on many many forums. People refer to issues of intermittent signal or sound loss and then if they move the switch slightly then they say oh it returns. Now this fault is twofold. When you look at the solder joints because it's a mechanical stress point the solder joints over time start to break down so you need to reflow them but that's a secondary thing the first thing you need to do is actually to remove the switch and then when you look from the back you can see there's a plate and you can bend up the lugs and then you then disassemble the switch and what I'm doing here is I'm gaining access to the wafers those are the switch contacts themselves and I remove them and then I use a fiberglass pencil and you'll see the link in the repair description at the bottom to literally remove any oxide coating which has happened over time which causes this intermittent contact and then I then spray then directly with deoxid to provide longevity to the repair and then also to remove any residual oxidization and then what I then do is I just reassemble the switch fold back down the, the lugs onto the back plate and then I then put the switch back in and then when you re solder the switch this is important so you push the switch back in and then secure its locking nut and then you need to push down on the board that means that it's then flush with the pins and then I can then resolder them then directly what's very very important is do not 
try and use something like emery paper, sandpaper or something which is quite abrasive. If you do that you'll actually damage the switch. And then if you look at these particular switches it's an Alps device but there were so many different types made it's often very very difficult to try and source them and you may have to use maybe a, a, a donor amplifier to try and get a replacement but normally if you undertake the work that I've just mentioned in virtually all cases you'll be able to restore that switch back to perfect operation so again recapping disassemble clean it down with a fiberglass pencil use the oxic switch cleaner reassemble fix it to the main front fascia chassis it's like a metal sort of cage mechanism over the front and then push down on the board and then resolder and that will be good as new and then the last part that I resolder then are the plus and minus 15 volt regulators sometimes you get some heat related issues on them but it, it's it's not common I would say and then what you also need to do is use deoxid or a high quality switch cleaner and then you can spray directly into the access holes on all of the user control potentiometers and literally rotate them backwards and forwards maybe even 50 or 15 to 20 times and then that will completely clear any oxidization and you don't get this issue where you have a crackling noise or intermittent loss of sound now this amplifier here uses output MOSFETs so what it's using are international rectifiers so IRF 540N devices and often the, a question can come so well you know what's kind of like the difference like between say a conventional bipolar transistor design and using a MOSFET well the answer to that is if you think about a thermionic valve which really would be I'd say like the holy grail like for audio so very high-end audio equipment still use thermionic valves and then also um, musicians would also swear by a thermionic valve because of the, the, the quality and depth of sound which is created. Well, with a bipolar transistor, you're not going to get that. But using a MOSFET is probably the closest that you can get. So in this case, this is an N-channel MOSFET that is then fitted. So again, I've said this many times, if you're going to replace any electronic component, if this was a failure of the output MOSFETs, then I would tell you go source then from a brand, non-brand, and the IRF in this case, and then from an, a very, very good source. So it might be, for example, Musa, uh, Digikey, you know, where you're buying effectively directly from a manufacturer, authorised distributor. Now what happens with a MOSFET, and again you can Google this in terms of operation, but just in a nutshell what happens here is that you have two terminal, three terminals. Okay, you have a, a gate, you have a drain and then you have a source. So effectively what happens is virtually minimal current, you're able then to switch on the gate and then you're able then to control the current flow directly through the uh, the drain and source or source and drain depending on if it was an N channel or then a P channel. And what happens with the, the MOSFET, as I say, it's very, very close to a thermionic valve in terms of uh, audio performance as well. But you don't get the same issues that you would see like with a bipolar transistor and many manufacturers still continue to use the output MOSFETs and for anybody who works like for example on power audio amplifiers or maybe on car audio amplifiers output MOSFETs are very very common because of the mode in which they're operating in typically uh, class D and you're able to switch a MOSFET at very high frequency in the order of megahertz rather than than kilohertz so typically that's why they are then designed so the reason why I'm mentioning that is it's distinctive for this particular RCAM range of amplifiers so they're not using conventional bipolar transistors they are of course using uh, MOSFET devices then just to give you a little bit more insight for this amplifier when you have um, so the 7R, 8R and 8P, you may have the microprocessor, okay? And you'll see some of the repair descriptions that it refers to a component called Z901. And it's actually a PIC, all right? So it's a programmable uh, microcontroller and the type number is 16C54X1. Now, if you have an issue with the PIC, what happens is it's fed from a 5 volt supply and on some of the designs what would happen is it's just using like a, a Zener diode and this Zener diode then starts to change and break down so then the voltage breaks over the threshold for the microcontroller and just destroys it 
So you're sitting there, you're looking at you're doing all your fault finding, but actually it's the PIC IC which has failed. The good news is you can still source these from uh, Arcam directly and they will happily provide the microcontroller for you. But I'm just making you aware of that if you went onto my channel and you use the search function, you would see some of the repair descriptions refer to the Zener diode increasing in voltage and then destroying the, uh, the microcontroller. So just that reference point on there. Then in terms of adjustment for the amplifier, if you refer to the service manual, the actual bias um, voltage stroke current is different depending on what model you have. So in this case, if it's a 7R, you would then need to adjust the current or the bias uh, millivoltage then from 3 volts to approximately 3.5 millivolts. Once that's done, then you can uh, leave the amplifier then on uh, test conditions. And in this case, this amplifier was then running for about uh, two hours. And you can perform, you know, all the various tests and everything else. But, you know, as this was more associated with dry solder connections on the MOSFETs, it really wasn't an issue where, you know, you, uh, I anticipated that there would be, you know, a fault that could happen over time because it was a specific fault relating to manufacture. And then the final part, and I've said this on the previous um, audio sort of overviews, what you would do, of course, is to uh, clean the amplifier, all right, and that's both the chassis, and then these rubber feet on the back, so the bottom sometimes cause people issues, all right, so what you have is like a plastic insert, and then it just splays out, they're four like rubberized um, like lugs, uh, sometimes people say, you know, the feet are loose on these, just remove the plastic pin, and sometimes what you'll find is maybe only two of the lugs are pushed through the board and some are pushed over, you can then reinsert them, but you know, for myself, whenever I've uh, dealt directly with Arcom, Arcom either for support or for spare parts, always been very, very responsive, which is, you know, absolutely excellent. And that's what you need from any company which is uh, providing equipment then into the marketplace. And there always appears to be, you know, spare parts available, even for some of the very, very old amplifiers. Or, of course, you could also choose then to... Uh, send your amplifier directly then to Arcam if you wish and they also offer a, a repair and service uh, facility as well so just a high level overview pretty much there with regard to this repair hopefully you've found it insightful and if you have any questions by all means you can uh, email directly to audio amplifier servicing at aol.com or just drop in the uh, in the messaging on this repair description uh, and I'll be happy then to respond back to you typically the same day. So I wish you all well until the next one. And thanks very much for listening. Goodbye.